churches of Christ, yeah. What, uh, what is that? Is that Morton? No, it's not Morton. No, is that the Christian? No, sign no. What is Church of Christ? You start to explain it and you feel isolated. Now, as you explain it in the usual terms, you feel sectarian. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's quit being so isolationist and let's go and listen and learn and meet people. Find out what they're doing, what they believe, and share our response to Jesus Christ with them. Few would have known that during the months leading up to the triumphal lunar landing of Apollo 11 that there were events taking place within the churches of Christ that would have lasting consequences, consequences that would take decades to grasp. Conflicts that largely played out in journals moved into an auditorium in Middle Tennessee on February the 6th, 1969. A one-hour open forum, later described with language usually reserved for courts, referred to a plaintiff, a prosecutor, a defendant, and a witness stand. The controversy was a movement in an organization called Campus Evangelism. Campus Evangelism provided a platform for the youth, about the age of the apostles when called by Jesus, to engage in important topics prior to accepting indoctrination. Campus evangelism, as Jim and I first envisioned it, was not to be another cr campus crusade for Church of Christ members. It was to be a movement. We were baptizing people in the ocean. Uh, we were leading people to, to the Lord on the right and on the left. We were dealing with people that had been burned out and disillusioned by the church and traditional religion. We envisioned people committed to the Lord, going on their campuses and sharing the gospel with their friends in the dormitories and it would multiply like mushrooms do. But we were the, the Campbell Stone stream of the Jesus Revolution. There were 40 assertions and allegations, mostly directed around a seminar held in Dallas the previous December. During the Christmas holidays, 1968, young people from all over the country were invited to Dallas, Texas for a campaign called College Evangelism. One of the leaders in this prayer group, I believe they called it, he told the old saw, the old story about the fellow dying and going to heaven, and he was being shown around, and there was a little group over in the corner, and he said, now be real quiet, that's the Church of Christ, and they think they're the only ones up here. And you have to remember, too, that in our seminars, especially the national seminars in 66 and 68, uh, we had a hundred teachers doing breakout sessions. And you can't go and control what a hundred different people say in an informal setting. You ought to see to it that you don't have speakers at max statements. Well, Brother Wood, we can't be any more responsible for that than uh, the administration of Freed Hardman College can be responsible for everything that's said in a lectureship. If you can't, you ought to disband them. But the hearing in front of a crowd of 900 focused around 10 allegations that concerned the forum planners. The stakes were the identity, traditions, and exclusivity of the affiliation of autonomous churches. A plan to openly discuss campus evangelism was proposed on February the 4th from Ira Rice Jr., editor of the journal for Contending for the Faith. We found Ira Rice and we asked him to meet with us, and we went off appealing to him on the basis of brotherly love. And Ira sort of swelled up and shook his finger in Jim's face and said, when it comes to truth, there's no place for love. And I'd like for us to come up with some ideas of what can we do to stop this apostasy. A few minutes later, after rejecting an idea from the floor to reach out to the elders in Lubbock, the home of campus evangelism, and hearing a few more comments, Guy N. Wood set the stage for a discussion that would take place two days later. Now, I believe, friends, that the, the churches of Christ have the truth, and I'm not going to be diverted one way or the other from my efforts to try to continue to preach the truth. And what you need to decide is this, whether or not you want to maintain the traditional faith and practice of the churches of Christ or whether you're ready for a new denomination. But our point is that we are being tried and judged and condemned on hearsay, Brother Wood, and that is un-Christian. Well, we're just as much opposed to that as you are. 
Ira Rice Jr. had been a successful and prominent missionary in Asia, and Guy N. Woods had been an effective orator and debater. The three men who led campus evangelism, Jim Beavis, Rex Vermillion, and Charles Shelton, had spurred evangelistic success in a new frontier for the Churches of Christ. We are looking at why a crisis occurred among these men who had so much in common. Perhaps we can learn something for our own challenges in achieving the kind of unity that Jesus prayed for. The story of campus evangelism was ultimately not about an organization and the men who led it or those who opposed it. Rather, it was about the soul of churches, the Great Commission, the questions that speakers and college-age students raise, and what happens when establishment watchdogs go too far. It is possible that this story serves up lessons for the next challenge of the status quo. Hello, my name is Steve Staten. I'm a consultant and investigator, and I seek to memorialize lessons from crises and faith communities for those who come along later. I invite you to join my journey of discovery into one of the most important high-stakes conversations of our age.